reasons rather than jump out. We uh, are locked into oil for transportation in the way that we are locked into virtually no other commodity for such a major role in our economy. If we were heavily dependent on rice and rice imports to the United States were cut off or interrupted in some way, we need more wheat or corn. And you can't do that with respect to today to oil with respect to its role in transportation. We are locked in. If it goes up, some people are faced extraordinarily bad economic circumstances uh, uh, and the economy as a whole around the world, all that oil in the countries, so uh, uh, some of them. Uh, second, two-thirds of the world's proven reserves are in the Middle East. And even if uh, uh, Simmons is right and the fields in the Gulf will hit their king of peaks, and it will not be as easy for the Saudis to increase production, swing production in the future and drive prices down when they want to undercut uh, uh, other uh, ways of producing transportation fuel. Nonetheless, we are likely to see for a long time, as Indian and Chinese demand grows, as European and American demand grows, we are likely, very likely, to see uh, uh, Mideast dominant for as long as we can tell. Uh, Third, the oil infrastructure is uniquely open to terrorist interference. This movie Syriana that's coming out in a few days is written uh, based on a book by my friend Bob Bayer, a former CIA officer. Bob opens his book, Sleeping with the Devil, uh, about Saudi Arabia, uh, with a scenario in which a terrorist hijacked 747 is flown into the sulfur clearing towers up near Rastadora, northeastern Saudi Arabia thereby taking six to seven million barrels a day offline for well over a year and drawing the world's economy into absolute chaos. I asked my friend Bud McFarland, former National Security Advisor and President Reagan, if that was a realistic scenario. He said it's much easier than that. He said, I'm an old Marine artilleryman. I could take those towers out with a decent uh, mortar crew. Third, fourth, rather, we have a situation in which or change of government or change of government policy in this very volatile part of the world could make a huge difference in our economies and the way they operate. There was a near coup in Saudi Arabia in 1979 with the great mosque in Mecca of the sea and there were assassination attempts against Saudi leaders. People say it doesn't matter much. Whoever rules in Saudi Arabia is going to have to sell their oil. Well, not much of it if they want to live in the 7th century. Bin Laden has said well over $200 a barrel would be a perfectly reasonable price for oil. Then, a lot of the money we send to that part of the world, especially to Saudi Arabia, comes right back at us. In the words, the mortal words of Poco, the old comic strip, we have met the enemy and he is us. We ship $160 billion a year. Will this year to Saudi Arabia for its oil? Some four or five billion of that goes to the Wahhabi sect in Saudi Arabia, which in turn produces fanatically hostile education materials, hostile to Shiites, to Sufis, to Jews, to Christians, to women, to democracy, and suffuses them throughout the Middle East and throughout the world. We also borrow in this country something on the order of $2 billion a day, every calendar day, to finance our consumption. Our current account deficit will exceed $600 million this year. About $1 billion per working day is $250 billion a year is for oil. I will use that we export largely to Asia in order to pay for our imported oil. Each one billion of that, $250 billion, that we're spent in this country is something between between 10 and 20,000 American jobs. It's an even bigger problem, this current account deficit for countries like Bangladesh, which have to try to pay for dollar-denominated oil, very expensive dollar-denominated oil, with things like textiles and commodities. And then, of course, there's global warming, because transportation is a huge contributor the warming uh, gas uh, emissions that concern all of us. So for all of these reasons, 
Secretary, former Secretary Schultz and I have uh, been working with a number of other individuals, like-minded individuals, to try to help bring some added people and uh, emphasis uh, to this debate about what we do about oil. We believe there are two major approaches that need to be taken. First of all, substantial increases in fuel efficiency for vehicles. And secondly, movement to much less expensive and diversified fuels. And we mean to do that in the existing infrastructure. Not with hydrogen, not with hydrogen, not with hydrogen. But, first of all, the world's biggest, two biggest industries, automotive and energy, have to go through a very elaborate Alfonso Gaston Act, trying to figure out who gets through the door first, because you decide whether you produce fuel cell vehicles or you produce hydrogen fueling stations in every neighborhood. Second, the cost, the expense, the risks of storing hydrogen, and the fact that if you're going to make hydrogen out of natural gas, it might make sense just to put the natural gas in the vehicle and not lose the 25, 30% of energy that you get by making the transition. And by the way, natural gas carries per unit volume about three times the energy that hydrogen does. Also, if you're going to make it out of electricity, why you would want to lose approximately 75% of the energy changing the electricity into hydrogen instead of just putting the electricity in the vehicles via better batteries, like in hydrogen, the like. So we are not talking about a hydrogen highway to anywhere. It's much more urgent than that. Now, as far as vehicles are concerned, certainly improved diesel is one of the reasons the Europeans get 22 miles a gallon on the average in their vehicle fleet, and we get 24, is because they are over half of the passenger cars for diesels. Modern diesels, as they get better, can be made, we think, uh, consistent with our emission requirements. Certainly, uh, with uh, hybrid gasoline electric uh, vehicles, certainly with lightweight materials of the sort that Amory Lovins at the Rocky Mountain Institute has suggested, the carbon, uh, carbon composites, cheap versions of those, similar to the ones that are used for aircraft, but especially now for the Formula One uh, racers. And also, flexible fuel vehicles, since it's less than $100 a car, and uh, you are talking about making a vehicle such as half of the Ford Tauruses on the road, compatible with burning E85, 85% ethanol, we see no reason to muck about with the CAFE standard requirements or give people CAFE credits simply require that all new vehicles be flexible fuel vehicles so that when ethanol is here and available to be used in large amounts, which I think it will be as we move towards cellulosic uh, ethanol, the, uh, the uh, vehicle fleet will be ready to use it. 